everyone, Felix here, Advanced Clinical Practitioner with Helan Clinic in Leicester. And today I am joined by Dr. Andrew Winge of uh, manmedicine.com. And we are going to be having a little chat about harm minimization. Hello, Andrew. Hi, good morning. Or afternoon for you. Yeah, yeah. afternoon for me, but yeah. please, thank you for Thanks for, for having me back. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. So yeah, so I wanted to have a little chat. We talked about this a while back, didn't we, about mm -hmm. making this video. Um, because it's it's harm minimization. You should probably define what that means. And in the realms of testosterone replacement therapy, it can be a bit of a, a taboo subject, can't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. And and I and I think you know some some people will want to really distance themselves from it as a, a provider of testosterone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. um, me, not so much, because I think you know we you know if we're going to say what it is, it's essentially. Uh, gentlemen and, and women, actually, that um, mm -hmm. may partake in the use of androgenic anabolic steroids mm -hmm. who want to um, ensure they're doing it in the safest way possible. Now, we mm -hmm. can wax lyrical for a long time about whether that's even possible. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so we're, we're going to be talking a little bit more about that today. Is that something you've experienced in your practice? Yes, absolutely. In fact, and, and I'm sure you can relate to this, many of the patients, uh, specifically men, but women as well to a much lesser extent, that that come to us, you know, looking for testosterone replacement, they, they, have, bec they have essentially made themselves hypogonadal from their prior use of these substances. And, you know, they may no longer use them, but they've just, perhaps they've used such mega doses over so many years that they have, you know, in some cases, you know, permanently altered their hypothalamic pituitary axis. And now they, now they, they have genuine hypogonadism as a result of prolonged anabolic steroid use uh, in some cases. And so, you know, they're, they're coming seeking treatment. Um, and then there's a smaller percentage, obviously, of, of men and, um, who are using these performance enhancing drugs. And, you know, and they, and to their credit, recognize that what I'm doing is potentially dangerous and I should have medical supervision when I do this. So it, it's by far, it's, it's the former, but obviously we both see men in that latter category yeah, um, as yeah. well, I, I, I think it's mirrored. It's mirrored in the UK as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so I would say, uh, ex anabolic users yes. um, probably yeah. account for around thirty percent of our patient workload. Yeah. Um, but there are a, there are a smattering of those guys who mm -hmm. are current anabolic users that mm -hmm. want to monitor their blood work, um, make sure that they're doing things as safely as possible, and do want to actually listen to clinical staff. Uh, when we say things like you're, you know, for example, you're taking a 17 alpha alkylated steroid, uh, your liver enzymes are starting to rise, mm -hmm. um, and they want that forewarning, don't they? It's, yes, um, and, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I definitely agree. It's that there's less of them than there are of the anabolic, what I call anabolic recovery patients. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's certainly something we're seeing, and that's and mm -hmm. a reason why we're doing this video today. Um, so I guess uh, in terms of talking about these kinds of things. Um, we need to. We can't really talk about it without sort of touching on ethics and, and legalities and things. Because yeah. I think there's a yeah. difference between our countries, mm -hmm. isn't there? So, what's the situation like in the states with regards to um, the legality of using yeah. androgenic anabolic steroids? Yeah. Well, you. We had this conversation before, and and you know, you taught me a few things about the UK that I wasn't aware of. In the United States, um, all anabolic. Uh, performance enhancing drugs, you know, anabolic steroids are, um, they're considered schedule three uh, mm -hmm. as, as a result of the Anabolic uh, Steroid Control Act. I think it was in 1991 and it came out of, there was a big baseball scandal back then when it turned out that like Barry Bonds and all of these famous baseball players had been secretly using anabolic steroids. And so Congress, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, against the recommendations of the American Medical Association, you know, lumped anabolic steroids, including testosterone, obviously, in as in with things like oxycodone and other other opiate uh, medications that, that clearly have abuse potential. Um, and it was a bit of a knee jerk and a political reaction. But, you know, that's the reality that we deal with here. So um, so these drugs are uh, they're illegal to possess and they're obviously certainly illegal to to sell or manufacture. Mm -hmm. Uh, without you know a, a, a without a physician prescription or you yeah. know being a legitimate pharmacy, and uh, you know it, and it, I believe in most states it's it's a serious felony. Now that doesn't yeah. stop widespread use. So yeah. uh, you know they, 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 it, it, the, the laws of supply and demand don't are not different in North America than they are anywhere else. So yeah. you know the, the 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 underground labs have filled that gap. 
whether they're manufactured here in the states which is probably the, a smaller percentage or manufactured overseas or maybe in mexico mexican labs and then imported yeah. in the united states there there's no shortage of underground anabolic steroids here yeah. which presents its own set of dangers obviously yeah um, exactly that we've talked about and, so you know and, and you know to give the sort of uk perspective on that um so they are schedule three part c drugs mm -hmm. um so including testosterone including things like um mm -hmm. methenolone otherwise known as remobolin or primobolin mm -hmm. or primo, oh, yeah. Yeah. um oxandrolone yeah. otherwise mm -hmm. known as anavar mm -hmm. um and uh, you know they're all um actually legal to possess and use on a personal level mm -hmm. but they are this is the interesting part illegal to be purchased <laughs> so so you have to ask yourself unless someone's very generous out there just go yeah. here you are they have to be they it. have to be gifted to you right? yeah exactly <laughs> and, and, and on that note the, yeah. it's a, it's illegal to supply them even uh without payment so yeah. so this is where i don't get uh, that law because it's okay for you to be caught with an amount that is deemed mm -hmm. um suitable for personal use but then the question is, how did you get them? Right. But nobody takes the law that seriously that they pursue that as an investigation. Right. What they do right. want to do mm -hmm. is get the importers of the raw materials for, right. as you described, the, the underground labs, because that, that can be a real issue because, you, mm -hmm. you know, people think about the word laboratory and what, what does it say in your head? It tells you clinical, clean, yeah, precision no, no. and underground labs could, you know, they could, they could be they like could that. Be. And I'm sure there are some that are very big business yeah, and absolutely. are like that. And then I'm sure there's also someone else uh, making it in their bathtub. <laughs> Absolutely, so, yeah, and you have, yeah. and and you don't know, you know, with exactly, with a good yeah. laser printer, you can make a very yeah. convincing label. Uh, if you yeah. can print a hologram. <laughs> yeah. Just, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and I think uh, you know that's that's something that um, when you're looking at harm minimization as a clinician or providing mm -hmm. a service like that, um, one of the first questions on a um, a consultation model that I've created for something that Healing Clinic uh, mm -hmm. will probably be getting into in the future, um, which is harm minimization. One of the first questions is, have you considered perhaps not doing anabolic steroids every time you see these people that are coming routinely for their bloods? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and they, they call that in the NHS where I work in England, they call that making every contact count where you ask a question mm -hmm. that might lead to a more positive outcome like cessation of using X drug. Right. Um, yep. So, uh, so yeah, I think um, you know when we when we think about uh, people that choose to to use these substances, um, it's got to be firstly about education, hasn't mm -hmm. it? Which is uh, essentially what we're trying to do here today mm -hmm. and, and raise awareness that mm -hmm. these these medications slash substances slash drugs, whatever you want to call them, um, are not all created equal. Um, no, and no, that's a great point. They've actually done studies on that, haven't they? There are papers mm -hmm. out there where they they tested. Um, the concentration and the composition mm. of underground lab steroids yeah. to see what their strength was and what they actually contained. I, I have Sometimes. some data right here for that. There we yeah. go. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. In which case, take, take it away, Andrew. If that's probably a good segue. Oh, sure. Yeah. So we can we can touch on this just real quickly. So I, I printed this out. This is a uh, a subset of some of the raw data from something called the Harlem study, um, and it was this is an excellent study. And and I pulled this up actually for our conversation today related mm. to cardiac harm minimization because they, yeah. they took a bunch of anabolic steroid users and did a series of echocardiograms on them. But w w one piece of data that they collected was um, they sampled the anabolic steroids that these men were taking. And they, you know, they listed all of the, you know, the different ones they were taking. And there were about 10 different anabolic steroids that were thrown into the mix in these 31 patients. But I'll, I'll read you just, just a few lines here, just so we don't, yeah. you know, in the interest of time. Um, so it said, of the 272 samples analyzed, only 13% contained the declared anabolic steroid only. So the bottle of wow. testosterone, the only 13% of the testosterone enanthate, for example, yeah. had just, it, it, had, it, it may yeah. have that in it, but it also had other things in it. 35% yeah. of the samples contained the declared anabolic steroid and an additional undeclared anabolic steroid. Um, 6% contained nothing at all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. there you um, go. That's it. <laughs> yeah, okay, here's the good one. 14% of samples contained some other pharmaceuticals, most commonly estrogen or progesterone. <laughs> wow. That'd be yeah. that's, someone, that's someone having a laugh, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's that's not that's not cool. Um, no. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, you know, the list goes on, but the point is that buyer beware. 
buyer beware. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the, the, you know that, and I think that's a great illustration of it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, so it seems we've uh, we've talked a little bit about it already. We could talk because mm -hmm. this is about harm minimization. What are the potential harms of using yeah. these types of uh, medications or substances? Yeah, there, there's you know there. You know, beyond beyond just the you know the uh, the you know the issues with the source in terms of infections and contaminants yeah. and things like that, um, you know the the thing that you see most commonly and the thing that makes the news is when when we hear about some of these young bodybuilders you know yeah. dying suddenly having sudden sudden cardiac death, for example. And so you know w w when I see a man for uh, a harm minimization visit, um, you know I. I have to look at everything from head to toe, but I, I, I focus a lot on the cardiorenal system primarily. Right. And, you know, the liver is an issue too. Um, but, you know, what I've noticed here, and again, it may be different in the UK, is there, there don't seem to be very many men, men using oral steroids here as much. And, and clearly yeah. with the oral agents, which, um, I, you know, I think if you're going to use anabolic steroids, you really should avoid uh, oral agents altogether for the most part yeah, uh, yeah, cl yeah clearly some are safer than others but um you know so i tend to see more injectable steroids which seem to be a little bit safer for the liver so clearly i don't ignore the liver but the the cardiorenal system is is really a, a huge issue so um you know i look at things like uh you know their atherosclerotic risk factors blood pressure management is a big one so yeah. as you know most of these most of these anabolic steroids um you know, activate the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. And so you have a lot of sodium retention, you have endothelial dysfunction, you have, uh, you know, have accelerated atherosclerosis. Uh, yeah. I have seen some, some incredibly terrible lipid panels uh, on men, especially yeah. using Trenbolone. Trenbolone seems to be oh. incredibly popular here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it is, you know, it's a, it's a horrible drug, obviously. And so I think, you know, it's like um, any progestogenic uh, steroids mm. is going to have that impact, and none none more mm. so than Trembolone, though. But, oh, um, it's so it's so bad. Nandrolone and like um, yeah. uh, Nandrolone and thing will have a similar impact as well, yeah. but uh, not to the same degree. Okay. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So you know the thing that that men need to understand when 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 they decide to go down this road is um, you know they they are accelerating so it, it they're accelerating many of the common problems that happen with with aging. Uh, in terms of cardiac yeah. dysfunction, loss of renal function, but they are accelerating these to a high, to, to a much higher extent. Yeah. So you know, I, I look at um, you know, I, I look at blocking the angiotensin uh, re receptor many times. Yeah. So with ACE yeah. inhibitors and ARBs, um, yeah, uh, but you know, I also use calcium channel blockers, and there's there's one or two beta blockers that I'll occasionally use for for other reasons but um i, I look at the heart uh, specifically i'm concerned about ventricular hypertrophy but the yeah. other thing that a lot of men don't realize is that as you go especially as your doses go up with with synthetic anabolic steroids and interestingly testosterone is is different than testosterone doesn't do this but even something like nandrolone, which is, you know, the, the chemical structure of nandrolone is, it's almost identical to testosterone. Mm -hmm. I believe there's just one methyl group. Yeah. So at a, at a cellular level, it, you know, it, it will skew the electrical conduction of the cardiac myocytes. And this is, this is shown in animal studies because we'll never have a human yeah. trial. It would not be ethical to do this to humans. No. But, no. but what you find <laughs> is that you have delayed of the cardiac action potential, prolonging of the QT interval, which you know, I know you're you're aware of, but for the listeners, it, yeah. a, a prolonged QT interval on your EKG is is potentially dangerous in terms of precipitating a sudden cardiac dysrhythmia. It, the worst case scenario being something like ventricular fibrillation, which is a fatal arrhythmia. And mm -hmm. if you're not defibrillated within a matter of minutes, you know you you, yeah. you are not going to have a good outcome. I mean, to give that some relatability to to lay people that are not in the medical community, mm -hmm. uh, the majority of sudden collapses in sports people who are deemed to be very fit are then found out post-mortems have long QT syndrome. That's correct. It's very, yeah. it's, it's much, it's, it's under-recognized. Yeah. Prolonged mm -hmm. QT, Brugada syndrome, all those sorts of things. So there, yeah. you know, there are men walking around who have those at baseline. And then if yeah. they throw in high doses of these synthetic androgens could be yeah. potentially taking their QT interval into a dangerous yeah. place. So there's a, there was a really interesting study that I want to touch on briefly, and I, I've forgotten the name of it. And it wasn't it wasn't animals, but they they gave rats very high doses of nandrolone, 
And then they, they tied off their left anterior descending artery to precipitate a, a heart attack. Oh, um, nice. So, you know, to, to mimic an, an acute occlusion, yeah. essentially. And mm -hmm. what they found was that the mice that were on nandrolone, they, they went into ventricular fibrillation much more quickly than the, yeah. the placebo mice. And they were, it was much more difficult to get them out of ventricular fibrillation when there was, when there was high doses of nandrolone in their system. And so the survival rate was massively different. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, on autopsy, they, you know, concluded that it was a result of the effect of these cardio, cardiac yeah. myocytes. So, yeah. um, I mean, I mean, I know it's only a rodent model study, but it, you know, that's, um, when you're thinking about cellular response, mm -hmm. and there's a reason why we use mm -hmm. these types of hugely, um, mm -hmm. Uh, what are they called? Heim Wistor rats, isn't it? Because that's the yeah. usual rat yeah. that's used that's right. in animal that's right. studies. Yeah, I forgot um, the name. Yeah. Because of their reproducibility. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, and I, I I read somewhere, like I'm not sure it's the truth of this, that um, that the there's an ethical reason why they use Heim Wistor rats as well, and that's because they always develop cancer by the time they get to X years of age, so they're oh. going to die anyway. So they use them. But I always think that's a bit of a, a bit of a poor model to be using if you know they're going to develop cancer. <laughs> like, right. So. Yeah. The, right. Maybe not the he, the healthiest. Yeah. Baseline apparently, population. that's an ethical reason. It may not be true, but it's just something I read. I, I wonder how yeah, Peter. I wonder um, how Peter would feel about that. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. I don't. I don't think but but the point of that study, and and I I was actually unaware of that until you know not that long ago. But you know I think I think most clinicians are probably at least somewhat aware of the macroscopic changes that happen to the heart with yeah. anabolic steroid use, the ventricular hypertrophy, which, I, which we'll talk about. Yeah. But the fact that things are happening on a cellular level that can, can, yeah. can um, raise your risk of sudden cardiac death in susceptible individuals um, yeah. is, is something that I don't think a lot of people are aware yeah. of and, and, and a bit scary. Yeah, it is because you would, you know, even if you were being, um, you know, showing your due diligence and sending someone for an echocardiogram of their heart to check for LVH or left ventricular hypertrophy, and you didn't know about what you just described, you'd look at that and go, yeah, cool, carry on. Like, yeah, you're you fine. Know. You're fine. Yeah. yeah it, so so getting a baseline EKG is a good idea mm -hmm. on these people. Yeah. But but even that, you know, because as you know, that QT interval can vary with heart rate and vary with, yeah, exactly. you know. Yeah, circumstance, yeah. It's, and, uh, and, you know, of course, the other thing that especially competitive bodybuilders do is, you know, they, they take diuretics. They, yeah. Um, yeah. they, especially, you know, prior to a competition become very dehydrated. So you yeah. start throwing in a little bit of kidney injury and a little bit of, yeah. you know, perhaps some hyperkalemia, uh, high potassium yeah. levels, yeah. electrolyte disturbances with calcium and yeah. magnesium. And now you've got this, this recipe for, you know, an acute lethal heart arrhythmia. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and, and I speculate, I, I talked about this in one of my videos. Um, you know, I, I'm, you probably are familiar with Rich Piana who passed oh, away, yeah. the bodybuilder, yeah, I think it was yeah. a year or two ago. Um, and, you know, I, his autopsy study is available. And, and you know, the, the interesting thing about his autopsy was, so of course he had massive cardiomegaly, like just yeah. like yeah. really just impressive really, cardiomegaly. Yeah, in the case. He, yeah, yeah. But he had, he, had, he, had, he had clean coronary arteries. So that's the other, you know people assume that you know and, and it is true that you'll have accelerated atherosclerosis but it, it, there's there's individual variation there, yeah. So yeah. you know n nobody will know for sure, but the the thought is that and I heard that perhaps he snorted some pre workout or had some sort of a stimulant that precipitated his demise, but you can imagine that in in someone who has a high level of these androgens also has abnormal ventricular thickening. Yeah. And then, and then you get yeah. a catecholamine surge, that could precipitate ventricular fibrillation. And, yeah. and again, yeah. I wasn't there; I don't know what happened, but that to me seems consistent with an acute ventricular lethal dysrhythmia. Yeah. Um, you know, that was precipitated by a catecholamine surge. That sure. perhaps, if you and I had had that cat same catecholamine surge, would not have precipitated. Yeah, yeah, that. exactly. We don't, we don't have. We don't stress know. Play. We don't. Yeah, know. and our, our ejection fraction would be well would uh, would be relatively normal for our body size, which it obviously so. wouldn't be for his. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. And so that's so. the other thing, you know, for the audience, you know, the it it, it the, a certain amount of thickening of the heart is normal in athletes. Um, in mm -hmm. fact, it's an indication that you have a healthy heart, and yeah. so uh, it is quite normal, especially in endurance athletes, but also in 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 strength training athletes, that the ventricle will thicken. And it, it's an appropriate amount. It actually improves the stroke volume of the, the blood, you know, that is leaving the ventricle. And so that, that's actually a, a healthy, normal response. 
Yeah. Um, but with anabolic steroids, that response then becomes pathological. Um, yeah. and, and one thing that you'll see on an echocardiogram is, is the, the, the internal diameter of the ventricle. I, I, I apologize if I get a little too geeky with this stuff, but no, you know, when, when the ventricle relaxes, um, you know, the, the blood will fill. And then the idea is that the heart will, the ventricle will squeeze, and that's the amount of blood that is ejected. So that becomes your ejection fraction. Well, in a healthy athlete, even though the heart is thickening, you know, it's thickening in such a way that when it relaxes, that volume, it either stays the same or it actually improves. So your stroke yeah. volume goes up. And when, yeah. when you do an echo, if, if the volume there is roughly, or the diameter of a relaxed ventricle is, they say about four and a half centimeters. If it's it's that or above, slightly above that, that that's okay. But mm -hmm. with this pathological thickening, what you get is actually you know growth. It, you have growth in the septum, uh, especially, and that actually yeah. narrows the ventricle. Yeah. And then on a on again on a cellular level, you have fibrosis and scarring. Yeah. And so that it impedes the relaxation of the ventricle, and so you end up with something called diastolic dysfunction at first, and then mm -hmm. you know as time goes on, you end up with you know, with you know, like a dilated, what they call a dilated cardiomyopathy. So the, yeah. the normal adaptations are, are great, they're healthy, that's what you want. But again, if it, in these anabolic steroid users and people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a genetic condition, um, yeah. the, the amount of blood that they pump per beat actually goes down. And that's actually, yeah. it was interesting that that Harlem study that I mentioned earlier, you know, they, they had these young men on, they were only on steroids for 16 weeks and there were clinically significant really significant changes. They dropped their ejection fraction, their atrium dilated. Okay. And atrial wow. dilatation for, for the listeners is something that can lead to atrial fibrillation, which is an abnormal, mm. you know, you essentially loss of function of the atrium. It can predispose to strokes and tachycardia. And then they also gained on average about 28 grams in terms of the volume of their heart, just over 16 weeks. And it took um, wow. eight months of being off of anabolic steroids for those values to normalize. So they did go back to normal, but it took eight months. Yeah. yeah now, and the truth not, is not, uh, most yeah. of these guys don't ever come off. They stay on continuously. Okay. So that process it, just, it just goes, it goes and goes. Yeah. So well, just going back to what you were saying about where um, these structural changes in healthy people in like endurance athletes, um, you, if anybody in the audience wanted to look that up, it's actually referred to in the UK. I don't know if it's the same in the States as athletes heart. Uh, yes. It's the and, same thing. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and one thing that's interesting clinically, if you examine these patients mm -hmm. and you've got the right circumstances, um, like a very quiet um, examination room, um, some, something like I've, I use quite a bit. I've got a, um, an amplifying device on my stethoscope. I do, I um, do too, yeah. Yeah, and, it, and you can actually hear an S4, so you've got certain yes. sound. Yes, yeah, it, very good, yeah. Sound. yeah. So you've got to S1 and S2, and mm -hmm. uh, you shouldn't really have other sounds. Yes. But you can uh, you can get a fourth heart sound uh, when you've got these people with athletes heart. And I That's had it right. fairly recently in a very very athletic fifteen year old mm -hmm. male who I, that then prompted me to do. He only came in for a sore throat. <laughs> Brilliant. This his chest. Yeah. Very lean, very muscular, and uh, that prompted me to do. Um, uh, we call it an ECG in this yeah. in the UK, but an EKG for anybody mm -hmm. watching in the states. And that showed the changes on there. So um, you know, uh, due diligence wise, I did refer him to a. Um, uh, a pediatric cardiologist who actually can get confirm my my uh, differential diagnosis about so that's heart. brilliant i mean you deserve a pat on the back for that because you maybe saved that <laughs> child's life and yeah, yeah. um you know i know how difficult it, it is really difficult to hear an s3 and an s4 yeah and especially yeah, yeah. like in the emergency room with all yeah, the background exactly, noise, yeah. it's really it just, challenging it that day it was super quiet mm -hmm. so it's, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but the thing it's is those people are out there and um mm -hmm. and you know they may be totally unaware that they have this yep. condition. Yeah, it's so. like they call it a ticking time bomb, don't they? Like absolutely. Need yeah, like absolutely. It's yeah. uh it, it's it's a bit scary and you know, unless you get checked out. And and that's mm -hmm. one of the things I wanted to touch on today is, you know, the, the, the you know, the vast majority of athletes that are using these these agents, well, first of all, that most of them are not competitive athletes at yeah. all, even yeah. bodybuilders. They they just they're just regular guys who just want to yeah. look a little better, feel a little better and yeah. You know, you know, they yeah. think it's going to help them maybe do a little bit better with the ladies, but, uh, yeah, yeah. and, but yeah. there, there, there's a very strong stigma and a, and a, a, a large degree of distrust of the medical system yeah. where they, they say, well, I don't want to go see a doctor. He's just going to lecture me. I already know what he's going to say. 
Uh, mm -hmm. He's going to tell me to get off this stuff that I'm killing myself. And, um, you know, I don't know how much success you've had, but I've, ha I've had very little success talking yeah, yeah, and it's, it's getting funny. men yeah. to stop using anabolic steroids entirely. Yeah. yeah. Now, I've had I, some I, I, success I with lowering their, getting them to lower their doses yeah. and be more reasonable. Yeah. But, you yeah. know, they have so to be ready. I had, a, I had an interesting one a while mm. back where they, they did initially lower their dose because, um, uh, you know, they were supposed to be taking TRT dose and they, were, they weren't actually using a random steroids. They were, they were in their late 50s, which I found was just an odd time to be doing this. Right. They, started, they started up again. I said, look, you've got, you've got to stop doing this. And they said, OK, and they agreed to lower their dose back down. And the next time I saw them, um, they'd made another change, but this time, which they thought was positive, yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I, I had to have another talk, and uh, they said, I'm not even doing steroids anymore. I've switched to SARMs because they're better, aren't they? Yeah. And I was just like, oh, no. And, um, and I told them, uh, and they, well, to be fair, actually, they'd stopped testosterone, and they'd switched it for nandrolone. Oh, and then they'd, yeah. They'd, yeah, and they'd said they were using estrogel. So they had some understanding because, right. obviously, there's no conversion of, uh, of nandrolone right. to, to estrogen. So right. they, had, they had some understanding from their days being a, a regionally competitive bodybuilder. Yeah. The next time I saw that person, I was like, it's been a while. Where, why did you miss your last um, follow-up? Mm. And uh, they'd had a heart attack. So, See? yeah, it's, you know, it's so unfortunate. Saying, yeah, yeah. You, you know, yeah, and, and that will have been the nandrolone. And I said, this is a progestogenic steroid. Mm -hmm. I said, this will mess with your heart. Like, Absolutely. They, they, just, they, weren't, they were like, I did it all the time back in the day. <laughs> it's like... But you weren't 57. Back you then. weren't 57. <laughs> yes, exactly. And, yeah. you know, some of this is, uh, you know, although, you know, clearly steroids are not addictive in the way that, you know, amphetamines and opiates are. But there is a psychological component to this. You know, the yeah. we talk about bigorexia yeah. and, and, you know, that that you have to have that conversation with people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, 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 you know, it, it's an uphill battle, but you can because it's true. I mean, you can convince guys that listen, you, you don't need these outrageously high doses to achieve the kind of physique that you want to have. No. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, if you look at the, the drug regimens of the bodybuilders in the 70s, where, you know, the, they looked phenomenal in yeah. the 70s. In yeah. fact, in yeah. my opinion, they looked a lot better than they do now. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, and and assuming the they're being honest, you know, they, they were using yeah. doses that the average gym bro, you know, today yeah. would just scoff at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so, you know, there, there's, it's just like this more is better mentality. And, and especially yeah. with trend. I mean, I know uh, there are multiple men in my gym under the age of 30 on trend alone. And, and the interesting I'm thing I'm is, you, you know, many of them don't even, they don't even have a single year of training under their belt. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, I mean, we, could, we could go down a rabbit hole of why that is. And it's gotta be social media. It's social media. <laughs> it's the, I, it's the American, I want it now. And, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, for it or wait for it. if only yeah. I can get this kind of a look, then I'll be happy. Yeah. And, yeah, 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 and yeah. we wouldn't, you know, we know that that's not true, obviously, because yeah. you'll never be happy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I remember a, a while back, I, um, I was challenged by a gym friend of mine. Let's see who can get the leanest in the next three months. Mm -hmm. And I, I took it so seriously. And I'm, yeah. I'm somebody who works in this field yeah. that I gave myself an acute kidney injury. Yeah. <laughs> Just just from the last two days, I mean, it was obviously mm -hmm. doing a uh, calorie deficit and lifting and doing a lot of cardio. Yeah. And in the last 48 hours, I decided to do a water fast for when we were doing the photos. And that's what did it. <laughs> yeah. like, 48 hours with no water while still training. Like, that's just not a good idea. Yeah, so, I have a friend who did the same thing. You can yeah, see how easy like, it is for yeah. young, impressionable people to go mm -hmm. down this route and end up mm -hmm. requiring help from people like you and me. Absolutely. Like, it's, uh, no, I did it just as a bit of a, a bit of banter with a bro. It's just like, and then uh, I immediately regressed it. It took me four months to recover my EGFR back up to normal. So that's that's a really great point that leads into the the renal stuff. If we you want to talk yeah. about that a little bit, yeah, yeah um, definitely. You know, the, we're seeing a lot of these retired bodybuilders now, and certainly like the ones that get into their forties and fifties now now have chronic kidney disease. Yeah. You know, many of them yeah, requiring yeah. dialysis. In fact, um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, was it, it was it uh, uh, Nasser Al Sambadi a number of years ago was was one yeah. of these mass monster bodybuilders. And I think in the mid 90s, I don't really follow bodybuilding anymore because I'm just not. No, I'm just not I'm interested. A, I'm a bit out of touch myself. But my understanding is, yeah, he died of acute renal failure uh, in his mid 40s, sadly. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just it's insane, isn't it? Yeah. And so one of the things he's that I that I drive home to, especially to competitive bodybuilders that do 
they do what you did, but on a you know on a ten x scale, yeah, yeah, is yeah. every time they they get on stage in that volume depleted, you know, dry state, and certainly if they're using um, that diuretics, is yeah. they they are killing off nephrons. So the, yeah. the nephron is the um, it's the functional unit of the kidney at the smallest level. It's got the little tubule. And, you know, you lose nephrons with natural aging. Um, I heard sometime, I don't know if this is accurate or not, but it's a little bit of useless trivia, but you start off with 900,000 nephrons uh, in childhood and, you know, you slowly will lose those over time. And, and you will lose those from natural aging, but there are a number of things that happen that will accelerate the loss of those nephrons, uh, obviously hypertension. But whenever you have an episode of acute kidney injury, you are killing off you know, probably thousands and thousands of those nephrons. Yeah. Now you have many hundreds of thousands, fortunately, to back you up. Yeah. And that's why you typically can get away with this for a long period of time and not see a change in the serum creatinine. Yeah. Um, and we can talk about maybe why serum creatinine maybe is not the best marker for picking up early yeah, kidney disease. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I've changed the way that and I do that. Is more of a, is more my, I, I, we offer cystatin C. Yes. Yeah. That, so that's what I was yeah. going to, that's what I used to, uh, yeah. you know, and I'll, I'll screen for microalbuminuria and, and things like yeah. that as well. If I'm, if I'm really suspicious, but, um, but the, yeah, that's a good conversation to have as well, but you can imagine, you know, if, if you repeatedly do this, let's say over the course of a 10 year period of time where you're just killing off nephrons and then you're recovering your, your, your GFR and you're killing them yeah. off and then you're recovering. There, there is going to become a point. It's sort of like with the liver, you know, the, the liver can take a beating up to a certain point and then yeah. you're done. And then, and and then you're done. Yeah. yeah. And then of yeah. course, if you stack on chronic hypertension, which many of yeah. these men have hypertension from, from their, their drug use and you tack on endothelial dysfunction, um, and even, you know, renal artery stenosis from atherosclerosis that they may not know that they have. You know, there, there's a lot of things that go into, to renal function, not to mention NSAID use. You oh, know, yeah. so many of these yeah. guys that I know, they're they are using ibuprofen and yeah. all of its, you know, derivatives on it because they have a lot of aches and pains from, you know, years yeah. of training. Yeah. So, um, you know, not to get too pharmaceutical, but, you know, the, the afferent arterial that bring, that perfuses the kidney is, requires prostaglandins to remain patent. And if you have NSAIDs in your system, specifically COX-1 yeah. drugs, you know, you constrict that, you restrict blood flow, and then you add dehydration onto that. Yes. And, you know, I, I know you've seen this many times, and I yeah. see it every day in the ER, the older person, they're on a diuretic for blood pressure, uh, they're on yeah. an ACE inhibitor for their heart yeah. failure and their, their blood pressure, and um, maybe some metformin too. Uh, yeah. and, then, and then they get an acute diarrheal illness and get severely dehydrated, and, and they come wow. in with a creatinine of 4.5. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and yeah. that's what tipped them over the edge. And, and that can happen to bodybuilders, except instead of a diarrheal illness, it's yeah. this, it's drying out for a show, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, and all of the other compounds they use yes. to do that as well, like your wind stroll and things like that. All that, uh, yeah, correct, yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, you know, the, 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 the key thing, I think, for audience members to take away from this that, that perhaps either do use anabolic steroids or thinking mm -hmm. about it is, uh, and it's been very clear to me, but because I know it, but it might not be to you, is the relationship between your kidneys and your heart. Yes, well, that's <laughs> why I say the cardio-renal system. They yeah, are, exactly, yeah. And I love together. that you said that. Nobody says that. Like, yeah. and, uh, and it shows the context, the context in which we're speaking. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it, it's like when you see a, a junior medic or a junior nurse and um, mm -hmm. they, they ask you why, are, why you're so bothered about this um, person's kidneys when you're worried about their blood pressure. And then you start to explain how your kidneys govern your blood pressure. Exactly. And then you start... And, uh, and then you try and sneak in the stuff like I know you do this as well, <laughs> where you get the uh, you get the steroidogenesis cascade in, so you can look at the mineralo corticoid yes. and the yeah. arm, but then you can also <laughs> talk about the uh, these um, androgen arms as well, like so yeah. just you know, so you can get that a little bit and get people thinking about it. Yeah, but yeah, uh, you see their yeah. eyes get big. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But it's just yeah. like you know, it's such a complex system that's so yeah. nuanced, but it's so important to be able to um, make sense of in the context of people using these. The, these drugs um, so that they can make a, a more well-informed decision about whether mm -hmm. they want to carry on doing this. And, you know, like I said, I'll always say, have you considered it stopping? And it's nearly always, it's not nine, nine times out of 10. It's like, it's no, but right. the, that one time in 10, I don't know if this is your experience mm -hmm. is usually, I don't know, 
follow up seven or eight where you're looking at their liver panel and their enzymes are going up yeah. and their, their, um, their kidney function is going down. You're like, yeah. look, this is really time to stop taking, you know, especially you mentioned it earlier on. And, uh, but in the UK, orals are, are very popular. Like, oh, so interesting. Dianabol, yeah. Anavart, all yeah. 17 alpha alkylated. Yeah. Like they, that's when, when you see they, they keep doing it because they think that taking a pill is way uh, lesser uh, no. of a problem than injecting. It's the and it, it couldn't be the, it couldn't be more the opposite. Yeah. So yeah, it's um, it is a problem here, um, and I think that's when I that, that one out of ten is when you uh, you basically it's a scare tactic. You say, look at this, this is mm -hmm. not good, and this is what it means. Yeah. And that you know that's usually where they stop. But sometimes they're they're already at a point where they've they've done like you said they've lost they've lost um, nephrons. Like it's uh, you know it's uh, or they've got significant lobular damage to their um, their liver. Like it's. Uh, you know, it, and, and it's it's horrible for it to be that they have to see so many numbers in the red before mm -hmm. they'll it'll hit home. Yeah. That actually they want to function healthily mm -hmm. more than mm -hmm. how they they want to look good. It's. Uh, I, I, I would uh, like to take a field trip with them to the dialysis center. Yeah. And, oh, and say, yeah, hey, yeah. listen, this is yeah. this is your life. You know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Mm -hmm. If yeah. if we don't save your kidneys, um, yeah. And and. You know, and, and sadly, you know, the again, that damage starts very early and yeah. it's it's you know how it is when you're in your 20s, you're indestructible. Uh, yeah. I, I felt indestructible yeah. in my 20s. And I learned the hard way that I, I'm not. Um, yeah. But you're right. Like it, it, sometimes when that epiphany, when that epiphany finally hits them, whether it's something on their blood work or in some cases, a, a, a heart scare. I had a guy that um, he had an episode of atrial fibrillation that brought him to the emergency room. And for him, that was kind of a wake up call. Yeah. But sadly, sometimes that doesn't happen until there's been a substantial yeah. amount of damage done. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. That's irrecoverable. Yeah. Um, yeah. In, you know, in terms of your, of your practice, do you, what kind of approach do you take when you see these guys? Is it uh, graduated or do you, you know, do you go for the, the big scare tactic from the beginning or? I, I try not to do the scare tactic stuff because quite honestly, they, they have heard that before. And, yeah. it, and sometimes it hurts my credibility, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, it's the same with, you know, someone comes in hooked on methamphetamines and or opiates, uh, like we talked about yeah. off, off camera. I mean, yeah. they, you know, on a fundamental level, they understand that this is probably not something I should be doing long term. So, yeah. you know, I, I do, I do encourage them to stop, um, knowing that maybe they're not ready to at this point. So yeah. I, I focus a lot on, on dose reduction. Um, I, I try to steer them away clearly from oral agents. Yeah. Um, and, you know, as you know, there, there really is, there is a difference between, you know, bioidentical testosterone and some of these synthetic derivatives, even, you know, nandrolone and, and you yeah. know, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, equipoise yeah. and all that sort of stuff. You know, I, it's been my experience. I, I've never seen a study on this, but maybe maybe you've noticed it, too, that people seem to tolerate if, if they're going to use high doses of an anabolic agent, they seem to tolerate high dose testosterone cycles, you know, testosterone only in mm. terms of what I see in terms of their parameters, as opposed to some of these synthetic agents that are unnatural yeah. to the body. And, th and that's just my experience. I don't know if that's, I don't have any. No, no, I, I agree. Like once you, once you, especially the 19 nor testosterone. Yes, derivative. correct. Yeah. They're the, they're the ones that really don't, uh, they, they, they skew the blood panel very quickly. But, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. More but, so, you know, if you're taking a thousand milligrams of, of anabolic steroid a week and, and that's what you feel like you have to do, there, there is, there does seem to be a difference between a thousand milligrams of say pharmaceutical grade testosterone and a thousand milligrams of, you know, fill in whatever agent. Yeah, you know, they, yeah. neither are good, clearly. No. Um, no. So, yeah. so I really, I do try to get the dose down. I try to, if they ins mm -hmm. absolutely insist on high doses of, of an agent, try to get them maybe more to pharmaceutical grade testosterone. Although clearly, I'm not going to prescribe that to them. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I and and trembolone. I, I I am a bit of a scare tactician with trembolone because I I just yeah. it's such a horrible drug. It yeah, that's that's you a know, I, no go. I would have to I'd have to find it, um, but I, I read a study once that they did. Um, this was a rodent model study yeah. that they gave um, rats um, trembolone, and then they biopsied their brain tissue, oh. and it actually had the ability yeah. to change neuronal tissue connection, like I it, which it. is which is absolutely incredible because and it and it sort of fits in with the stories you hear about people. Uh, it does. Having, it makes sense. 
huge states when they're taking large doses of tre trembolone and, and they're having complete breakdowns. Psychotic it's, episodes know, even. Yeah, 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 actual like psychosis. Like, it, it, you know, it, and it's because on a cellular level, it's altering brain tissue. Like, so why would anybody you know, take it to begin with and, and you, also in high doses? And you wonder if that's reversible. You know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, so, maybe so I, you know, to getting back to what, you know, my approach is obviously dose reduction. Um, and, you know, I, I, I try to convince them that, listen, you don't need these high doses to achieve the physique that I, I, when I probe a little bit, what I find is that many of these men, they're not training properly. Their nutrition is not what it yeah. should be. And they're using these mega doses of drug as a crutch to yeah. compensate for, for poor training and poor nutrition. And if, yeah. if they would just do those parts of things correctly, they could find they could cut their dose by a two thirds yeah. and, and, yeah, and exactly. achieve a similar result. Um, I focus a lot on blood pressure. Um, yeah. you know, I, th there's three drugs that I, I tend to favor in, for blood pressure. Uh, and obviously every man is, is a little bit different, but you know, mm -hmm. I, I mentioned briefly ACE inhibitors and angiotensin yeah. receptor blockers. Uh, I think you're, you're also a fan of a uh, telmosartan. Um, yeah. Yeah. they're all that. good though. You know, all, yeah. both, all those drugs, it's a class effect, yeah. you know, are, are helpful yeah. in, uh, preventing, uh, unhealthy ventricular remodeling. Uh, they are helpful with endothelial dysfunction, which is clearly yeah. an issue systemically, but obviously in the heart. So, Another one I add into that, I don't know if you do as well, is low dose Tadalafil. For yes, anything. thank you. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So I yeah. was going to mention that as well. So Tadalafil, yeah. and in particular Tadalafil with the beta blocker Nevibolol or uh, by, yeah, by Stolic, yeah. because yeah. as you know, I mean that that has some influence with uh, nitric oxide synthase. So you may yeah. get you may get some synergy there. Yeah. And yeah. athletes tend to prefer that. If, if I have to use a beta blocker, I don't jump to those initially, yeah. but um, it, it seems to, in terms of exercise performance, um, it doesn't seem to inhibit their maximum heart rate and yeah. uh, exercise output yeah. as much as, for example, you know, atenolol or some of these other yeah, drugs. Yeah. Although then, I, have to, I, I must mm -hmm. say, the bivalol I see um, having a much greater impact on their resting heart rate. Yes, correct. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, at rest, it, it seems to work wonderfully, but then it, it is, will still allow them to perform athletically. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, um, and then, you know, if I need to, I can add in a calcium channel blocker. Um, yeah. I, I try not to use diuretics in men for a, a myriad of different reasons. Uh, but occasionally these guys are so volume overloaded um, yeah. that even blocking, you know, the renin angiotensin system is not sufficient. And a low dose of a thiazide, at least until I can get their fluid balance under control, yeah. might be indicated. Yeah. And then maybe I can take them off of it um, at a future date. So when you um, when you start them on those medications, mm -hmm. um, and I know I know you've done quite an extensive video on this actually. Um, if you also have the issue of them having secondary polycythemia. Um, do you do you act on that if it's having an impact on the cardio renal system as well, or do you just well, monitor if, that? Well, if I think it's clinically significant, I will do it because uh, clearly, um, you know, very high hematocrits. You know, one of the components of hypertension is volume, is blood, is you know, yeah. intervascular volume, and so you know, if you're running around with a hematocrit of 58 or 60, 60 yeah. percent, uh, then you know, clearly that you know could be playing a role in that, but. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I don't tend to phlebotomize men on a regular basis unless it's absolutely yeah. necessary and they're symptomatic. Uh, I, th I think the data is very clear that, um, you know, that elevated hematocrit from secondary sources, as we've talked about, you know, things like testosterone, altitude, et cetera, yeah. are not associated with thrombosis. Um, yeah. And so, um, but, you know, I, there are men that do not feel well when their hematocrits yeah. get high. And, and again, this gets back to individualized care. Uh, we don't cookie, yeah. cookie cutter things in my clinic or in yours, and so yeah. uh, if you know if if I feel like it's necessary, then we'll have that that conversation. No, uh, yeah, yeah, I've definitely seen yeah. that type of patient where I they've got um, they've got they've got a a, a hematocrit of say fifty four, fifty five, mm -hmm. um, and but they just feel terrible, like they feel sluggish, they feel like they can't take a full breath. Going up the stairs gets yeah. them panting, and then they, you know, I say, well, it is an option. They go and do it, and then they come out and say they feel a, a They feel better. Yeah. yeah. And those are the same men that I, again, I would be reluctant to put them on a diuretic because yeah. clearly that's going to, you know, it, it will up their, yeah. their hematocrit. So, yeah. um, so anyway, th th those are the three meds that I tend to use. Uh, you know, sodium can be, it, some men have salt-sensitive sodium or salt-sensitive yeah. hypertension. Some don't. 
Um, yeah. You know, body weight, uh, sleep apnea is a huge issue uh, with these yeah. men, especially in their off season when they're bulking. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. sleep apnea, it, it's a, it's a, I think everybody should be screened for sleep apnea essentially, yeah. you yeah, know, yeah. Re, you know, regardless of, of whether you're using anabolics or not, because, um, it, it's yeah. just I such mean, a... I, I, I personally, uh, suffer with sleep apnea yeah. and if you were to look at I do me, too. I am not the bills that you would associate. I would not with... assume, I no. would not assume, but there's probably something structural in your oropharynx. Yeah. That... Yeah, yeah. So, so that, yeah. that's the thing. I've had a, yeah. a sleep induced, a drug induced sleep endoscopy, mm -hmm. and um, and it is a lateral wall collapse with me that just yes. just closes. Yeah, like, like, yeah it's you know it's, it's one of those things. But I'm not your typical big over overweight man mm -hmm. um, or, or mm -hmm. very muscular person with a lot of weight on their chest. Yeah, it, absolutely. It just it's, it is what it is. But it's yeah, something it that is what it is. Absolutely. And so I get very aggressive with lipids. Um, you know, as you know, I, I'm, I'm really big on cardiovascular disease prevention. And so, um, you know, again, with it, it, it varies on the man, but certainly with older men, I uh, have a very low threshold for obtaining echocardiograms, um, coronary artery calcium scan, or more or preferentially angiography if I can get it. Uh, oh, wow. It's yeah. a high, very high cost and limited availability yeah. where, where I practice. but. Um, you know, screening for early heart disease, um, you know, in, in men that, you know, typically by age, you wouldn't suspect have heart disease. But again, yeah. you know, uh, there that there was a bodybuilder that died not that long ago, uh, Dallas McGarver. It, oh, yeah. I, I yeah. believe he had a sudden cardiac death at age 26. And, yeah. you know, I saw his autopsy report as well. It was interesting mm -hmm. to contrast him and Rich Piana's. They both had massive cardiomegaly, but... Um, but Dallas's heart, he had severe triple vessel atherosclerotic disease. And I think he, I think he died from an acute right coronary occlusion, if I recall, yeah. I, I could be wrong. But the point is, you know, that was a guy at age 26. No, nobody would think to do a coronary angiography on that no, guy. No, of course they wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. He, but, but yeah, you he, and I probably would. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, but to um, most and, other people, he's the image of health. And like, sadly, the, somebody, if, if that had been done, you know, maybe he would still be here with us because they would have yeah, found his. Yeah. He, he, based on what I saw in his his uh, his autopsy, I mean, he would have gone for a, a bypass. I think. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. At least a, at least a triple bypass. Like know, at age twenty six, and that would have probably ended his bodybuilding career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. But at twenty six, I mean, that's. Well, I mean, we've just um, you, there's um, German bodybuilder famous on Instagram, Joe Lidner. That oh, has just, yeah. he just died, right? He died last like a week ago. Yeah. Right? So he, 30 years old tragic. and for the absolutely tragic the preceding three days before he died he kept complaining of bilateral neck pain uh, like, which is, i know it's just uh, you know and then he you know they, they were still waiting the autopsy report on him but um um he was very suspicious. open like he was he was quite open about abuse of eczema stain mm. like so you know uh, that's probably worth that to you it's not just it's not just these anabolic steroids that's it's what true comes with them, the, that's a the great end, that's a great point you know, and you know that's why you and I are, are we don't like to crush people's estradiol. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's you so know, important. It's, if, it's, if it's causing symptoms, causing problems, yeah, very low dose, like yeah, maybe for a short period you know, of time. Yeah, very short period of, with a view to getting them off it. Like you don't want them. But he, 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 Jay Lidner spoke openly about how much he took them because he was so scared of estrogen rising, and he said he knows he shouldn't, but he just can't help it. And so like, you, I'm sure that would have played a part. That gets back to some of the psychology that we talked about earlier with, yeah. you know, with, with bigorexia and, and um, yeah. you know, just it's, uh, you know, you, you, you can sit there for hours, you can show them the papers and, yeah. and you can show, you know, and it's, it, yeah. it, it, it's an uphill but, battle sometimes. There's some, they're just obsessed with estradiol. I've had a few patients like yeah. that. And yeah, I just have yeah, to say, yeah. listen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. And I, I, I covered this a bit um, in a talk recently with mm -hmm. TRT Hormone and Optimization Channel mm -hmm. with Dr. Devos. Um, you, we do need to look at markers in the blood. We need to, we need quantitative Absolutely. biomarkers. Absolutely. However, with estradiol, and I said this to him, it, it to me at best it's a surrogate marker, if, and especially dependent yes. on the modality of yes. testing you're using. Correct. Yes. You know, if you're not using ultra-sensitive testing and you're just using yeah. electric and luminescence mm -hmm. assay, it, you may as well just be stabbing in the dark because it just, Absolutely. you know, I've seen, I've seen uh, the same blood sample be tested via electric luminescence, chemiluminescence mm -hmm. assay versus liquid chromatography and mass spectrometry. And the, the standard testing, the electric chemiluminescence, brought back an estradiol of 190 mm -hmm. miles per liter. And then the ultra-sensitive test brought back uh, an estradiol of 100. Like, so, 
one wow. of them wow one of them yeah. is like way over and you'd be like oh get this guy uh, uh, a a a a aromatase inhibitor mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the other one was completely normal like so yeah. you know and even yeah. still like regardless of whether it's ultra sensitive or not it, it's 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 not so much an endocrine hormone it has other functions it's absolutely. like i'm so glad paradigm. you said that absolutely yeah it's yeah. you know so we need to be we need to have an awareness but use it in conjunction with the rest of our examination findings and other markers it's uh you know yeah. it's very challenging because then you know you have to take all that and then you have to apply it to the individual sitting in front yeah. of you yeah, yeah. you know who exactly. who as we talk about a lot you know there are all these people that have these different polymorphisms and yeah, are, are exactly. slightly genetically yeah. different and this is yeah. a hard specialty it yeah, it is. It, it, yeah, yeah. And that's and why it can't be cookie cutter. It really is. No, no you exactly. Have to... It's because it's so individual. Like, and, and you know, what, what the textbooks say should happen for one guy may not actually be what's happening oh, no. for the guy. Oh, no. No. <laughs> Well, we, I always joke with my medical students, I say, well, this, these patients, they don't read the textbook before they come in. Yeah, you know, exactly. they, they don't yeah, tell yeah. us, they don't tell us what we want to hear. It's yeah. our job to extract the information yeah. from them and then make yeah. an interpretation of that. Oh um, yeah. yeah. And that, I mean, that's, that's um, hard. You know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of literature um, scientific literature about how information from patients to clinicians changes oh, yeah. the, the number of times they tell their story. Like, so the oh, first person, yeah. In triage, they get a completely different story to what the consultant may get when they're the final senior reviewing the patient. Yeah, we call it yeah. historical yeah. alternans, as yeah. opposed to electrical alternans. Historical yeah, yeah, alternans. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would drive me crazy. I would go in as a medical student and I would take a history, and then I'd yeah. go out and present the patient, you know, to my attending, who would, who would come in next to me, and yeah. get a completely different history yeah. right in front of me, and he's looking at me like, "Did yeah. you?" Did you just yeah. make up everything? I said, I swear yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what the guy said. Happens all the time. The literature identified factors as to why that happens with patients. And, and, yeah. it, and the, the, there is a point to this coming back to our minimization. And it's because they aren't trained like we are to tell their no. story with a no. beginning, a middle and an end yes. with a view to getting a diagnosis. Because right. that's our job. That's so how we, we think, yeah. Know, and then that, that brings it back to this, like we have to ask the right questions of these guys that are coming to mm -hmm. see us in order to get the right outcomes for them. And, and that could be that they um, just monitor themselves a bit better, perhaps adjust mm -hmm. their training, adjust their doses. Mm -hmm. or it could be that they stop. Like it's, you know, and it's, it's about making sure that we're asking the right questions to ensure they have all the information and tools to make a good decision because we can't force them to do it at the end of the day. I lo that's and that's exactly my approach is that, you know, I feel like my, my job as a primary job as a physician um, is, is guidance and education. Yeah. And I, I believe very much that, you know, people are entitled to make their own healthcare decisions. But of course, you can't make good decisions if you don't have good information. Exactly. And so, yeah. um, you know, I, I try to, I, I'm fairly blunt and I, I, I like to tell things as they are. Um, and, you know, some, some patients like that. Some patients want you, yeah. they, they come in and they're, they're just looking for you to confirm what they already want to do. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, yeah. oftentimes you can't do that. You know, they, they I, I have guys that come in and they want me to bless them, sign off on this, this cycle that they want to do. <laughs> and I yeah, say, no, no I say, I'm not going to, I, you know, they, they say, is this okay? I said, no, it's not okay. Yeah, it's not okay. It <laughs> but, but if you're going to do it, this is what yeah. you should, this is what you yeah. should do to yeah. not I'm, harm yourself. But I, yeah, by no means am I going to yeah. tell you that, that, that that's okay. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good point because that isn't what harm minimization is no, about. <laughs> no, no. It's not about no. being a, a I'm not here to rubber guru. stamp your <laughs> your protocol. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not going to rubber stamp that for you. Yeah, it's, it's, no, thank you. Yeah. It's about highlighting how dangerous it is and, uh, and looking at a way that if they are refusing to mm -hmm. not do it, um, do it in a manner where we can monitor them and ensure their safety moving forward. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if anything, you know, I, I would hope that anybody out there that's watching this would um you know if you're going to go down this route and i understand that, that many men do it, it, find a physician find a provider who who is willing to monitor you you know i i understand that you know the medical community does not they don't understand athletes in general no. and then the subset of athletes that use performance enhancing drugs even if they're not athletes just people that use performance enhancing drugs that's an even smaller subset of physicians yeah. that will understand that and and uh, you know, you and I have, have talked about the, the 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 stigma and the sort of looking down the nose at, at these yeah. these people and, and sort of treating them as lesser, uh, you know, people that use anabolic steroids, yeah. but don't do the same things with people who smoke cigarettes or, or exactly. addicted addicted to opiates 
um, you know, that sort of thing. There, there are, there are avenues for those people. But sometimes, yeah. you know, people that use performance enhancing drugs, the physicians will just kick them right out of the office. They yeah. won't even. Yeah. They won't even. Yeah, I've, I've, talk I to mean, them. you must have heard phrases like where, or stories of phrases that, like where it's like, well, you did this to yourself. Like, what did yeah. you expect? You wouldn't well, say that to Mrs. Smith, who's 87 with lung mets because she smokes six. Right. You know, four, exactly. Six a day. You, yeah. You refer her to the oncologist and get her well, chemo. Treated. If you didn't eat so many cookies, you wouldn't have di diabetic <laughs> diabetic yeah, yeah. neuropathy. So yeah. you know, I'm not going well, so to. As, as a punishment, I'm going to not treat you. Yeah. That, you yeah. know that. Not only is that absurd, but it's it's incredibly unethical. Yeah, uh, yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, for, you it, know, it's worth do no harm. Like, so yeah, you know, you, exactly. But, but if you not unless you've done anabolic steroids, it's just, yeah. Uh, yeah. So it's I would not, encourage guys. You know, it, it, you're going to run into physicians like that. Um, you know, don't let that discourage you. There, there are physicians yeah. out there that will. Um, and, and, and there are clinics out there like yours and, and like mine as well like that yours, yeah. that will not do that to you, uh, mm -hmm. and that will will do what we can to help you and and ideally get you off of these agents, you know, because that yeah. Yeah, that's always the I, ultimate goal. I, you know, my job is to act into in your best interest, and and I'm if and that's usually in your best interest is to not do those yeah. things. Oh. But <laughs> um, you know, but at the same time, I'm not going to mock you or throw you out the door. And right. I know you you would yeah. never do that either. Uh, right. And I and I love the fact that you now that you've got this beautiful clinic I can see in the background opened up. Yeah. That yeah. now there's a there's a resource there in the UK uh, for these young men and women to yeah. come and see somebody in a judgment free way exactly. that can get the care that they need and maybe yeah. the, maybe we'll see less of these people dying early. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and that's that's the ultimate goal, isn't it? Absolutely. It's, to, it's, to, it's preventative health. <laughs> it's absolutely. Like preventative health. Absolutely. Not, not re reactionary, where you're you're then uh, you know seeing them come through your ER to be certified. Yeah, I don't want to see the, yeah. I don't want to see any more young bodybuilders dying and or hearing about no. it. I don't want to see, you know, bodybuilders that are retired now in their forties and fifties that are now dialysis dependent. Yeah. Or yeah. are uh, you know we call cardiac cripples from, you know, yeah. dilated cardiomyopathies and all mm. all of these things that are largely yeah. preventable. Yeah. Exactly. So it's uh, right. I I would prefer not to do that. You know? Yeah, exactly. So. Like, and, and and same same for over in the states, and it's it's Oregon you're based in. Aren't That's you? correct. Like, yeah, on the west coast. Great, it's yeah. great to have a clinic like yours that is out there looking mm -hmm. out for these young men and women because that we, uh -huh. we we need to acknowledge there are female. There are women out there, and and you know women um, are using SARMs as well. Yeah. And yeah. at high rates, and I don't think it's talked about as much as no. it should. Yeah, uh, it's not going to lead to anything good. Like the the, no. the liver damage panel, like and the lipid panel mm -hmm. dis dysregulation I see from SARMs users is, is yeah. huge, and on and relatively small doses and short duration. Isn't like, that interesting? Yeah, it, mm -hmm. you know these, uh, the, you know the, there is this myth that these these drugs are benign or that they're safer alternatives. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's sort of like vaping. Oh well, I, I vape. I don't smoke yeah. tobacco. Yeah. I don't smoke. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I would never do that. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, no, it's, uh, you're lacking, not doing yourself any favors. Things aren't there. But uh, no. Like, so, um, where can where can people go to hear about your services? Uh, sure. So yeah, you know, I have a YouTube channel. Um, people can reach out to me. I have my I have an email address there. My uh, website is www.manmedicine.com. So I run a small telemedicine practice. You know, in the States, um, uh, you have to have an individual medical license for, uh, for every state that your patient is in. So I, I, I currently wow. do telemedicine for men only in uh, the states of uh, Oregon, Utah, Texas, and Florida. I will have some other states available in the pipeline. But I'm also available to people worldwide for uh, consultations and just guidance and coaching in the realm of age management, in the realm of health optimization, body composition changes. Uh, and, and that's actually one of the, the most enjoyable things about this practice is that I have had the opportunity to meet and discuss with people all over the world, in the Middle East, in, in Asia, in Europe. Um, and uh, yeah. so I'm, I, I, I love to talk about this stuff, as you can tell. Yeah. I, I'm very passionate about it. And so uh, if anyone wants to reach out to me, they can get a hold of me that Fantastic. way. Brilliant. And uh, maybe our, uh, our next collaboration, we can maybe touch on, uh, on the growing world of peptide use, I think. Oh, gosh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I know you've done some videos on that as well. We'll, be great uh, we'll need to do a few sessions on that one. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, <laughs> possibly. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, for, thank uh, you, Felix. I really appreciate and, it. This uh, is fun. And we, and we will uh, certainly be talking again soon. Sounds like a plan. All right. Bye-bye. Take care.
All Man Medicine video and audio has been created and shared online for informational purposes only. This podcast does not constitute the practice of medicine or professional healthcare services of any kind, including the giving of medical advice. I am not your doctor. No doctor-patient relationship has been established. This content is not meant to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied upon solely for that purpose either. The only purpose of this content is to present peer-reviewed, research-backed health information for your consideration. As always, rely on the advice and guidance of your personal physician before undertaking any activity presented here, and if in doubt or not comfortable with said activity, practice discretion. Your health is your responsibility and not ours. Finally, I take conflicts of interest seriously. I accept no compensation whatsoever from any private corporations, including pharmaceutical or supplement companies. You can trust that if I recommend a medication, product, or service, it's because I genuinely believe in it and not because I'm being paid to endorse it.